What cartoons did you watch growing up? I know I watched X-Men, Transformers, G.I. Joe. Right? They always ended with, uh, no, I guess half the battle, the G.I. Joe did. My children, they watch uh, Scooby-Doo. They love Scooby-Doo, the old Scooby-Doo. And uh, they also love, but they found a new one that they love. And, and you may or may not have run into it. There's a cartoon called Bluey. And I invite you to pause this video and to go into the description on YouTube, and you're going to find a link to an episode of Bluey, uh, and just watch the first chunk of it. The first is a seven-minute chunk, and uh, it, it, they, they play a game called Keep Me Up. Just go, go watch, pause this and go watch that if you can. If you aren't able to go watch it, let me just give you the brief, short synopsis. There are two kids, two dogs, kid dogs, and they have a balloon. And they play, they play where you keep the balloon up in the air. The dog, the adult dog, the dad dog, walks in the room, and uh, he starts uh, playing with it as well. And he turns on fans that blow the balloon around, and he just he plays with it. And at the end of the seven-minute cartoon, they all end up in a pile on the ground, having played Kiwi Puppy. It, it's really delightful. And uh, watching this cartoon, there's something missing from it. There is no moral. There is no like lesson that they need to deal with. There's nothing that this is trying to teach the children. Like the, I think back to that GI Joe and nobody was half the battle. Like there was always some lesson that children's stories, children's cartoons are trying to teach children. And, and for this, this there is no moral. It's just a story of children playing with their parents. Well, just a story. Let's think, let's think about what it means to, to be a story, right? And how, how stories function. That's what we're going to be looking at today. And uh, to get there, we need to make a hard turn from a 21st century cartoon to go back to a, let's go back to a first century letter. Where we're going to go to the letter that Paul writes uh, to the church of Thessalonica. This is at the beginning of the letter. He writes that uh, to the church of the Thessalonians, we give thanks to God for all of you mentioning you in our prayers constantly, remembering before our God and Father your faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope. For we know that, beloved by God, you have been chosen by God. Because our message of the gospel came to you, not in word only, but also in power and the Holy Spirit, just as you know what kind of persons we pre proved to be among you, you became imitators of us, so that then you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. And so this is how Paul starts a church. Like we see here, part of how Paul starts a church. When Paul goes to a community, a town, city, he, he first gets a job. He's a tent maker, usually. And then he'll go to a synagogue and start telling people there that the, the Messiah they've been waiting for has arrived, his name is Jesus. And they'll go to the Agora, which is the uh, marketplace of ideas. It's the common entertainment of the day. You want to see something interesting, you go down to the Agora, uh, where you go to this, where people are going to argue and, and see what they have to say, to the philosophies and new theories, etc. And so you get these people together, and, and they're interested. And, and what, did he, what did he have to work with, with that? Like, he's looking at the room of people, and what does he do with that? Well, first, he teaches them what Jesus taught and did and said. Right? So he can tell them about Jesus. And then he can look, he can look at, at them and say, and I'm following Jesus. Do what I do. He could point to himself and say, imitate me. And, and this is the way that Paul was trained. This is the way that Jesus trained others. Like if you go back to Jesus, what Jesus did when he gathered disciples is he got them together and they went, they did what Jesus did. When Jesus was out, was out teaching, they were there too. When Jesus was out healing, they were there too. Right? And then when Jesus sent them out two by two to go and do what I have done, right? as he tells them, their instructions. And, and so this is the way the Jewish people, rabbis, it's not the way they train people. So this is how Paul trained these new Christians at Thessalonica. Right? 
get together, let me tell you about Jesus, and then follow Jesus the way that I follow Jesus. What does the follower of Jesus look like? Well, it looks like me. So do what I do. So as I'm reading through the letters of Paul and taking notes on them, it has struck me how often he talks about this. Imitate me. Right? Imitation is a way to make followers of Jesus. Imitate me. And, and that's what he praises Thessalonica for, right? You imitated me, and now you're doing a great job of it, because now the other churches of Achaia, right, what we would now call Greece, modern Greece, they're all looking to you, and they're imitating you. Y'all done great. You imitated me, others are imitating you, we're all imitating Jesus. This is awesome. I was reading this letter to the church at Thessalonica, it struck me that this is how the first churches grew, but we don't talk about imitation much. We don't talk imitation, about imitation much because I think it's uncomfortable. It would feel odd to talk about imitation because first we would have to be willing to be imitated. If someone came to me and said, Andy, I want to imitate you, I would say, are you sure about that? I'm not sure what you're talking about. Like, huh? Right? I wouldn't be comfortable. It would feel arrogant. Right? Especially if I asked you to imitate me. Like, I think mean, y'all should imitate me. But that feels a little remarkably arrogant statement to make. But this is what Paul praises the church at Thessalonica for. Paul praises the church at Thessalonica for becoming imitatable. So, I gotta level with you. Like, if I'm gonna tell you what type of pastor I want to grow up to be one day, and when I grow up, or what type of pastor do I want to grow up and be? I can tell you that you know, I want to grow up and be wiser and humbler and bolder. But what I really, if I was being honest, really honest, what, I'm going to, what I really should tell you is I'm trying to imitate my friend Joel, who learns and learns and learns and reads and learns and studies and goes to continue education and he learns. He is always reading and learning something. I want to be like Joel. I'm seeking to imitate my friend John. Who doesn't take himself too seriously, who gets over himself and, and just does whatever is needed, and, and, and that's what he does, right? I take myself way too seriously. John doesn't. I can really respect that. I'm trying to imitate that. I'm trying to imitate my friend Rich, who is always doing something bigger, grander, vaster, so that he can get through to people how much God loves them. I can tell you that adjectives, I want to be wise, humble, and do grand things. But really what I'm trying to do is be like that. I'm imitating them. And if I could, I could tell you about my dream for this church, not my dream, not what I desire, what I hope for this church is that we are bold on the things we need to be bold about and we are wise and patient on the things we need to be wise and patient about. But what I really should say is I want to be like Palmyra and I met this church. Palmyra and I met this church up in the northeast corner of Missouri. They have been bold about uh, their discipleship and their youth, right? They, they entrusted, the youth said they wanted to run their own youth program, and so they did, and they have, and they are, and they're doing a great job, and it's really impressive. They have been bold with that. They have tried new things where they, they, where they need to try new things. And on the things they need to take slowly, to be wise and patient, that's, that's what they've done. Like, they just finished a new building that took them a decade to plan because it takes a while to get everyone on the same page and, and they were wise and they were patient and I can't tell you how many times I've given that pastor over there, Eric Anderson, how many times I've given him flack. You got that building done yet? But I gotta tell you, like, they've been wise and patient about it because building a building is a really big deal and it matters and you gotta get everyone on the same page, right? That's how it should work. So I can tell you what type of pastor I want to be by who I'm imitating. I can tell you what type of church I want to lead by who I hope we're imitating. I gotta tell you when I look at this cartoon, Bluey, if I could tell you what type of dad I want to be, I want to be like that dog. Right? The dog in that cartoon. Because the dog in that cartoon, that dad, he just jumps in and he plays with his kids in a wholehearted way that I am just moved by. Right? I was online looking at something and I saw an ad for something completely random. A tortilla blanket. Let me show you the tortilla blanket. I bought it. I looked at it and I thought, this is crazy. But why would someone do that? Who would buy that? And I realized, I'm going to buy it. Because this was my favorite Christmas present of, of, of all of them this year. 
Because I realized I could take this blanket, and the, my kids opened it, and they were very confused. And then I told them I was hungry, and I wrapped them up in this blanket, and then I pretend, pretended to chew on their heads while, those, while they squealed. And it was like a moment out of this cartoon, and their kids were laughing, and I was laughing, and, and Olivia was just confused. And it was awesome. This is how we work. Right? This is how we, we learn. We imitate the stories that we see other people living. Right? That's how we learn. That's how we grow. Like I can look back to um, the way, one of the major reasons that Olivia and I were able to figure out how to get married, how to be married, is because Carmen Ward, uh, a wife of a retired Methodist pastor, uh, also was retired from teaching music, I introduced Olivia to Carmen, and they could sit down and they could talk, and Olivia could hear Carmen's story. Like, I, I had told Olivia, I had answered every question Olivia could ask about the Methodist Church, about when they're moved, how they're moved, how does the church work, where do you live, how does uh, pay work, how does insurance work, like, I, could, I answered questions, all, all the questions that you need to answer, all the questions that are wise to ask, but answering questions and giving data was not what made it possible for us to be married. In large part, like, we owe our marriage to Carmen Ward sitting down with Olivia and saying, let me tell you the story of how it worked for me. And then in seeing that, Olivia could see how it could work for her. And so she did it. That is the way that Carmen helped Olivia. It's in the same way that, like, I look at that dog and I think, I want to be a dad like that. It's in the same way that the people at Thessalonica looked at Paul and said, I want to follow Jesus like that. It's imitation. It's knowing people's stories and imitating and saying, I want to do that. They did it. Now I can. And so reading this letter from Paul, right, who he is praising the church for imitating him, it leaves me with this challenging question. Like, do I dare invite you to imitate me? Maybe. Maybe if you're looking at me, you see someone who's trying to learn a little bit more about Jesus. Someone who's trying to get out in the community and make a difference. Someone who's trying to be humble and wise and bold and all the things I've told you. Maybe that's what you're seeing in me. Yeah, I guess. We take that. But if we're going to talk about imitation, especially when it comes to pastors and leaders in the church, there's a nasty habit that we've got to get over. We've got to go back to the early church one more time. You see, when the church was sort of putting itself together, there were some people who uh, felt called to go off, or called to go off and pray, to spend their time in prayer for the rest of the church. And then other people would join them in praying, and eventually these, uh, they got to be called monks and nuns, and they grew into these monastic communities. That's, that's good. The problem arose when it became an assumption that there was this like higher way of following Jesus, and then there's what everyone else did. Like this high, higher way of following Jesus is what we see in the monastics, the monks, and the nuns. Like they can really follow Jesus. They can really do everything Jesus asked. And we're just going to kind of slum it down here and get by. We're like some will follow Jesus, and they're they're amazing, and we're just kind of bumming it. And, and like this professionalization, like they're really following Jesus. They're praying for us, and that'll be just fine. And the way it turns up today is like the pastor, he really follows Jesus, or she really follows Jesus. We kind of get along, and the pastor's kind of like our professional Christian. Right? He'll, he'll, he'll be Christian sort of for us. Martin Luther, in the 16th century, he re responded to this vehemently, and it's part of what split the church and what we now call the Reformation and split the Catholic Church into the, all the different types of church that we, we know today, right? Luther and uh, Presbyterian Methodist, all, it's, all of them are spinoffs from this moment when Luther argues to the rest of the church and says, no, there aren't multiple ways of following Jesus. There is one way of following Jesus. We all are equally called to follow Jesus, and, and so we are all equally capable of following Jesus. And I agree with that. Right? So that old temptation remains to see pastors as special people. And, and, and I join with Martin Luther in saying, phooey, hogwash, right? That's not what it is. Like just to, 
I started reading the Bible when I was in college because I thought it was important and I saw other people reading the Bible and I thought I could do that too. I saw them getting up in the morning to read, so now that's what I do. To this day, I get up in the morning and I read the Bible. Not because I was going to be a pastor, but because I saw other Christians doing it. Right? I am, all the things that I learned about being a Christian, I learned long before I was a pastor, and I learned from watching others. And, and I am no more special than a mechanic or a banker or a farmer or anyone else, or in Paul's case, a tent maker. Like Paul made tents, and people could look at him and say, yes, he can make tents and follow Jesus, I can do my thing and follow Jesus in the same way. Way. Paul was just a normal guy. Others could look at him and see what they could do. So, like, I'm the same thing. There are some specialized things I've learned to do over the years. Like, I know how to feed a hundred people. That's not a normal thing to learn how to do. But that's not at the core of being Christian. At the core of being Christian is I read the Bible, I pray, I visit people, and I help people I can. And you can do that in the exact same way. And so with that understanding, understanding that there's not multiple ways of following Jesus, I'm not a professional Christian, I'm not Christian for you, I'm willing to be Christian with you. If you want to imitate me, then you want to imitate reading the Bible, praying, visiting people, serving people, as a, and, and doing that, looking at me and saying how I follow Jesus and saying I can do the same thing, great, imitate me. But be aware that if you're imitating me, what we're really always doing is looking to Jesus. We're seeking to be like him. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your servant Paul. Thank you for all the people who looked to him and saw in him someone that they could imitate. Guide us to choose people to imitate ourselves, people who can help us to follow you. We pray not just for ourselves and this church that we might be able to imitate others, but we pray for your universal church, that your disciples might walk into the, all of their respective communities, not just here in Shelbina, not just in Missouri, but in this nation and across this world, such that as we walk out into the world, people will see us and say, I want to be like them. We pray for all those who are dealing with vaccination, even while the healthcare system is still struggling with so many people suffering with COVID. We pray for all of these things as we pray in your name. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you this day and always.